Um, so hello and welcome. Thank you for logging on and attending today's virtual program. Uh, my name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, please let me know if there are any technical issues which I can try to resolve. You can ask those to me in the chat. Uh, questions and answers will be addressed at the end. You can use the Q&A button at the top or bottom. Um, this program is also made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. We are also still accepting submissions for our program on problem gardens on July 22nd. You can send images of your garden, your problem gardens to carryprograms at minlib.net and I'll post that in the chat. I'd like to now introduce Ashley Rooney, past president of the Lexington Field and Garden Club and author of numerous books Ashley has been running our weekly gardening series this spring and summer, bringing a wonderful cast of experts with diverse gardening interests, as well as being an expert herself. So please welcome Ashley Rooney. Thank you, Matt. And I'm so glad you all are here today. I hear we even have people from Philadelphia, which makes this really exciting. And with me, I have Barbara Persia, my co-author on this and other books. Barbara is a glass artist, a great editor, and you will see how good she is with the computer because she really knows how to run it. And this, uh, uh, this fairy garden one, she really went to town. And fairies are so much fun. We wanted to show our readers some of the phenomenal designers of fairy homes and gardens when we started. And today we want to inspire you to design your own fairy house and garden. Now, what is a fairy house? Wait, can you wait a second? Sorry, we're having technical issues. Now, what is a fairy house? Unlike doll houses, where objects are made to look like tiny versions of the real thing, fairy houses incorporate a whole nother level of imagination. We see this house, and some of us, at least I do, immediately think of Hansel and Gretel that which should come right out that door right now. And this one reminds me of Rapunzel. Just look, coming out that long window, you can see the prince and note the dragon's head and tail. This is a much more garden oriented one. Great for us gardeners. Berries love small things and pink and purple flowers. So select for dainty violas, the alyssum, the blue flowered lobelia. Dwarf plants and slow growing plants are useful because they won't quickly overrun your fantasy landscape. We recommend succulent plants like low growing sedum, ground covers like ojuba, moss, low growing allium, miniature allistomeria, and lysimachia would also be appropriate. Woodland plants like trillium, anemone, ranunculus, and primula, along with dwarf ornamental glass grasses like carex, make great selections. And a fairy garden can always use fantastical, magical looking plants like cyclamen. And don't forget plants with fairy-like or magical names like epimedium, which means fairy wings, or dysphorum, which means fairy bells. I love this house in the woods. When you make your fairy house, shrink down to the size of a fairy or at least a small child and imagine the spaces you would like to inhabit. How would you spend your day and create the objects necessary? Sure, you have wings, but after a long day, you might want the assistance of a tiny ladder, a twisty staircase, or even a rope to help you get from one level to the next. Of course, some fairy homes are much more elaborate, such as this one. The front door is constructed with transparent films, which have been printed with images of actual dragonfly wings. Making fairy houses is about more than just gluing little pieces of bark together or stacking stones into the semblance of a tiny natural home. It is about tuning in and listening to nature. It is about being open to whatever you might see or feel or think about while walking and looking for materials. It doesn't matter where you live. Nature is everywhere, even in the cities. If there's a waterfront area, you could find driftwood or shelves or smooth round walks. 
In the woods, you might find bird feathers or even a deserted nest, bark, moss, and how about Jack in the pulpit? This fairy house won't last long, but just look. The designer shaped daffodil cottages from living daffodil flowers and leaves in situ. She sewed them together. When done, she leaves them there for the fairies to enjoy. This fairy house uses a combination of natural and synthetic materials. The designer cleaned and oven dried a pumpkin shell at a low temperature to create the roof on the simple five inch high audible load. Flat driftwood creates the floor which is mounted to a wooden base. The two pillars of the house are thick pieces of driftwood branches. Silk flowers, synthetic mushrooms, and fall berries are accents. A round wooden disc is covered in birch bark. On the table is a wand made from glass beads surrounded by orange gemstones. Here you have a whimsical log home with a small pond, a vegetable mirror, and animals. Some believe that the blue flowers will flourish in your fairy garden as they portray fantasy and intrigue. What you can make from natural materials is almost as limitless as your imagination, especially if you can make it in miniature. If you like the desert look, plant small cacti and sedums, but obviously don't add a moisture loving plant into that mix. To get a pond, you use a mirror. Look for plants that stay small, such as dark eyed cranesbill with its delicate long blooming pink flower baby tears, or tiny growing plants, such as terrarium plants or succulents. The animals graze quite happily here. Barbara always points out it looks like they're not keeping up with the mowing. Beach fairies adore seaside cottages. Shells, smooth rocks, sea glass are just the things for making tiny furniture. They are perfect building material. Notice the sea urchin stools the shell plates, and even the sconces are shells. This designer made a two-story house with a chimney capped with a garlic bud. A pink flower is the porch light. Here in this outdoor gazebo, the designer used sand dollars for the rugs. Pine cones, acorns, moss, all in our woods right here. The materials are endless and collecting them is half the fun. Want to know what to do with that feather you have saved? Here we have a peacock feather and twig settee for the peacock room. Fairy houses can become McMansions too. And here is the Fairy Delicious Bakery. The designer used a decorative iron bird cage wrapped in vines of artificial leaves, berries, and pink cherry blossoms mounted onto a round tree stump. As the local fairies know, this is a lovely place to have a cup of tea on one of those long hot days at one of the tables set with cupcake minor tablecloths. Inside, homemade pastries, pies, cakes, cookies, tarts, and bread are artfully arranged on the counter, baker's cabinet, and the circular shelf that runs along the interior of the roof. Doesn't that make you hungry just to look at it? Some designers, such as this one, make good use of all those trinkets that we stow away because they're so cute and we're sure we'll find a use of them somewhere. Or it was a gift from so-and-so, or it was that one earring. Notice here the artichoke chandelier in this kitchen, the cinnamon stick hanging rack and the Frank Burners. They must have brought those back from a trip to France. In other words, many designers are echo artists, which is a nice way of saying they transform trash into treasure, mix it with nature, and end with a magical scene. And you can too. This charming outhouse uses cedar shingles, twigs, shells, rock, bark, and a girly calendar. Notice the handmade toilet paper rolls and the shell toilet paper lids. And look at this wedding scene. Moss lines the aisle. See the wedding cake and the presents? 
Now, some of us like to have clearer instructions on how to go about creating. As part of our book, we interviewed um, Jay O'Rourke in the New England Nursery in Bedford, Massachusetts, which has held several fairy garden seminars, as have other nurseries. Jay described making a fairy garden to Barbara. She began with a broken pot and recreated the bottom by lining it with a moss mat and saucer. Of course, if you were planting without any drainage, place a thick layer of gravel at the bottom before you add any soil. Then she added sheet moss and potting soil to create the landscape. Mixing a time-release fertilizer into your potting soil will start your plants off right. She secured the stacked pots with bamboo stakes and added soil and packed spaces between the pots with sheet moss to prevent a landslide. Keep the top of the root ball of each plant level with the rest of the soil. Pat the soil firmly around and in between the root balls of each plant to keep everything in place. Water several times when you first plant to get a consistent moisture level. Treat it just like any new planting. Once the garden is saturated, make your design. Scoop out dirt to make pathways and add the rock or pebbles. Jay used um, polished stone and broken pottery for the stepping stones, which provided texture and interest. Different kinds of moss, both natural preserved, gave her a variety of colors. Plants that stay small are ideal for your fairy garden, but sooner or later you may have to replace them, or at least prune them. Try using club moss, baby tears, herbs, and succulents for less maintenance. For example, woolly thyme will create a mat of gray aromatic foliage. There's also heat and drought resistance. Another possibility is heat-tolerant ornamental strawberry with its white blossoms in spring and tiny little strawberries in the summer. And voila, look at Jay's final product. Don't be afraid to trim. Some low growers like baby tears or wood sorrel can be severely pruned and will bounce back quickly. Our advice to the novice fairy architect is this, start by thinking small. Fairy houses can be made from your imagination. They can be short and fat, tall and skinny, simple or elaborate and so on. Decide which style you like before you start planning your design. Straight lines make planning simpler. Find a good base, here it was a basket. Start with a planter, a tree stump, a hollowed out tree stump, a flat rock, or even a wagon for a traveling fairy garden. You can use a milk carton, a birdhouse, cardboard, or twigs to make the structure. Decorate with bark, flowers, rocks, shells, pods, acorns, earrings, feathers, beads, buttons, and bows, etc. And then fill in the surrounding area with miniature plants. The secret is let yourself go. Feeling stifled? Feeling a bit bored? Check out our book for more ideas. You can visit us on Facebook and post pictures of your fairy homes and gardens creation. And now, I'm up for some Q&A and I have no open questions. Oh my. No open questions at all. Okay guys, please ask your questions. I did do some research. Um, there's a difference between outdoor fairy gardens and indoor fairy gardens. Frankly, I think outdoor ones are really fun because you come upon them in the woods and you see them and you think, oh, this is great. For outdoor ones, you can use just dandy dwarf Noki cypress, jeans dilly dwarf spruce, miniature jewel fir, dwarf mugo pine, sky pencil Japanese holly for your greens. For your flowers, you could use miniature daisies, flats, black breasts, buttons, cranes bill, small hens and chicks, which are great to work with, and Irish moss. And you can make it a real garden out there in the woods or wherever you're working. Find a nice tree with a hollow in it. That's always a good one to work with. Or you might just find a flat rock that you want to put this on. You can use small branches, buildings to add height to your miniature garden to mimic an outdoor garden. And use the shorter plants as bedding plants to create a lush understory by mixing up the textures of the plants. 
All the plants in your container should have the same light and water needs for the best success. So if you're doing an indoor garden, you would have totally different plants and you would have different needs of what they're gonna want. But all fairy gardens should have a drainage hole and a matching saucer. It's much easier, otherwise it's very hard to water. And use a good quality plant coaster underneath the saucer to protect your furniture if you're gonna keep it inside. Now, uh, let me introduce you to Barbara since you're thinking about the questions. Here's Barbara. Hi. Right here. And she is the one who made all those fantastical animations along that computer and stuff. And she did a lot of the research with a lot of these um, fairy gardens. And another helpful way to be certain your container of plants and accessories work well together is um, they found a scale of the agent. For containers 10 inches in diameter and larger, or for in ground mini gardens, use the larger sized accessories or a one inch scale. For smaller plots, they're 10 inch in diameter under using medium size or one half inch scale. Now for tiny little pots, two to four inches, I once got a fairy garden and a teacup as a get well present, use the smallest scale or one quarter inch. Wherever you buy your materials, I understand Hobby Lobby has a lot of them. Um, you might also just look through the woods in my jewelry box of broken jewelry and Barbara, where do you look? Um, um, actually, a lot of the garden stores carry them. New England Nursery has miniature things. You can also find them on, of course, Amazon as well. But a I'll lot of plants have, yeah. have them. Um, just as for the plants, then you go into Amazon also has them, and they'll see fairy garden plants. They're all advertised for people. You could also go to a place like New England Nursery in Mahoney's and say, I'm looking for fairy garden plants and look around. Yeah. They'll have a lovely day over there. It would be great. When you, um, now you should, when you're working with fairies, sometimes a lot of people leave an offering for the fairies. Um, and if you've lost something, you can tell them what you've lost and you hope that with, if they take your gift, they will tell you where the missing object is. Usually the fairy will accept pressed flowers and herbs and jewelry and nuts and seeds, or shiny or pretty stones, so if you want them. Fairy gifts, however, from the fairies are all, also is not traps, so the great caution should be used with them. If you ain't give you gifts, gifts are expected in return, I am told. Hey guys, no questions out there from any of those people? You, you answered the, um... Materials or you buy question, materials. Right? Yeah. yeah. There's okay. nothing on the chat. Oh, there are two on chat. I don't know. So, someone saying. asked in both the QA and chat if you're able to show the photos again. But no, but Matt, will you tell them how they can get it on the YouTube? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, so all this um, will this whole uh, lecture will be recorded and put on our YouTube channel, the Carrie Library YouTube channel. Um, and I will send those out to, I will send out the link to that uh, to all participants and anyone who signed up. So you'll be able to go at your own pace. Thank you. And the library has the book. And so does Amazon. Okay. Oh, so Barbara, this is your baby. All right. So one of the questions that we've been asked is, how do you attract fairies to your garden? Um, had a lot of little questions on that. The first one is you want to plant flowers that attract fairies. So, and pick a variety of colors because different fairies like different colors. So pink and purple are really important. Right. Attract the fairies to your garden with water. Here we have a little fairy looking over a little pond. You can use a cup, you can use a bowl, you can use, like I use my dog dish, um, and plant little things around it or put it in the middle of, of your garden to attract your fairies. One of the things people do is they gather small shiny things and they leave them around. So how many of you have little glass nuggets or just 
little shiny things, little shiny objects. And leave fairies a snack. Fairies do like to eat just like we do. Um, we have some little fairy cookies and um, other little tasty treats. Create a fairy house. This was one I found in the woods when I was walking. Somebody found a hollowed out tree stump and just using the things that they found around, moss, bark, rocks, leaves, little pine leaves, and they built a little fairy house. And I just, just discovered it walking through the woods. Now fairies don't like people to whine or frown, so we should always be happy. And they like to know that you, that they are welcome. So you can put a sign. And be kind and generous to wildlife. Treat all wildlife special. The picture in the middle is an actual fairy ring. And a fairy ring is, is mushrooms that grow wild, that leave a little hole for the fairies to climb in. And lastly, be good to the earth. Um, this is where we live. It's the only one we have, so be kind. Thank you. Ken, we got some fairy, uh, maybe you can um, answer this first one, Barbara. How do these fairy gardens relate to the Victorian fairy garden? I don't know about the Victorian fairy garden. I don't either. Um, I think fairy gardens got, became popular around the 1880s, no? That's probably the Victorian fairy garden. Yeah. I would have to research that, Diana, and send you. If you want to leave your email, I will look it up. Um, Pat would like to know, do you know of any fairy garden meetup groups? It would be fun to share and exchange ideas with others. Um, people write back and forth on, say, on our Facebook. We have a Facebook. Um, that I've seen. I haven't really seen a meetup group. Have you, Barbara? No, I, I think I think on Facebook you, sh you might be able to communicate with people. There are a couple people on that page that have um, done a lot of different fairy gardens, and um, we've posted pictures of them. And I'm sure that they would be really interested in in talking about it. I think if you sent that question in, people would probably reply to you. They will, usually people these people love to talk. And from Miranda, question for my five year old: We have an idea of the area of the yard where many fireflies have been this year. You're lucky people were worrying about the dearth of fireflies. Would this be a good spot for a fairy garden? Do they hang out with fireflies? Barbara? I think any place in your garden would be special and I think fireflies and fairies would get along very well. I would think they would really like it. Because fairies really like shiny objects and fireflies are really cool. Shiny yep. up. And you can really put them out there um, and give them a place. The fireflies probably, all bugs want a little bit of water, so be sure to give a little pond or something that they can have a little water in. Yeah. What kind of containers do you recommend? Oh, there's so many. I love the, I love the dried squash at the beach. I think that's fascinating. Or the pumpkin shell that you saw later um, for the top of the boat. But they use all sorts of things. Um, it depends on how complicated you want to be. A basket is the easiest thing to use. Um, as long as you have a saucer underneath it for watering, I think the basket is very easy. Yeah, one of, one of our artists used a teapot. Um, okay. Another artist created something out of paper mache. So they had a balloon and they used the paper mache and then they broke it and then they, had, they could use the inside uh, for a fairy garden. Uh, people use tree stumps. Um, I keep walking by and seeing little hollowed out areas in my trees that are just perfect for fairy gardens. Oh, yeah. So I would like them to be a surprise for people as they walk by. Yeah, especially in the woods when you're walking. I've been over in Garfield Woods and there's some hollows there. And there's one place where I guess some kids have now have a big fairy house with lots of twigs and stacked underneath it. Um, even my dog sort of steers away and knows that it's sort of mystical and he shouldn't go near it. Um, if, and if you're at the beach and you find driftwood, you can build a little driftwood shelter and use the shells as furniture. Right. We had a wonderful one in the book. Um, it was an Englishman 
and he found a tree with a hollow and he did a little door on the outside. And that was the fairy house. So it was, it was yeah. great. I really liked that one. Actually, another one of our artists from overseas had a little picnic table that he put on a lily leaf and he had little sea little snails on there having a picnic. It was charming. Yes, and then um, another part of the book shows um, they make fairy gardens in a school for kids who have gone away to a school. And the older teenagers were doing absolutely fantastic things. They made boats and all sorts of things. Yeah. If you have a brook, you really could do things with that. So you can really have fun with it. Um, but fairies really do not like being spied on or having their privacy invaded. <coughs> Many stories in folklore involve a person who stumbles across the fairies doing their normal thing. And if they're seen watching, they can be punished. So it's a good idea to respect fairy places and to trust your instincts when you feel like you should or shouldn't go somewhere. If you do happen upon the fairies, it is probably best to stay quiet and hidden and wait for them to move on. Unless they make it clear from the start, they know you were there and want you to be involved. Do you research the elves and fairies of Iceland? No. Um, Icelanders even rerouted a road not to disturb their homes. Oh, da! I wish you could tell us all. Um, that's fascinating. I had no idea about that. I could unmute them if, if they wanted to uh, talk about that. Say that louder. I, I could unmute them if they did want to talk about that. It's up to them. Uh, oh, would you? How to, oh. Da, would you talk about that um, out loud so other people can hear? It's okay if you don't feel comfortable. You just let us know in the chat. Okay. I can unmute. I can give you elevated permission. Okay. Yeah, we have to have permission. So I think that would be quite fascinating. Um, and of course, we always hear about the fairies in Ireland. Um, that's where I really know. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, no open questions. Okay. Your Q&A is going back and forth, so I'm trying to figure out what's happening here. Okay. Um, and oh, here. Oh, they do want to talk. So, uh, da, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow you to talk. So, you should be Don able to. Clinton. You should be unmuted. Am I unmuted? Yep. Okay. Um, when I was in Iceland, I've gone there twice now. The whole island is just loaded with fairy houses and pathways um, from the road and everything. In 2014, they rerouted a road so that they wouldn't go through the fairy land. It's very highly, um, the Icelandic people believe so strongly, I think even more than um, Ireland in terms of fairies and elves, um, that it's just a fascinating culture in terms of that. And you'll see it while you're walking up in the mountains in the middle of nowhere land. You see the, you know, the uh, skies of the um, midnight sun, and then you'll see these fairy houses and the horses, and it's just a magical area in, in its totality. Um, Thank you for sharing that with us. I did not know that. I have not been to Ireland, though, Iceland, so it would be interesting. Me neither. That would be very cool. Iceland is definitely, you know, well, the um, Icelanders um, invaded Ireland, and a lot of them were brought back to Iceland. And there are actually villages that have the um, Irish um, names. So I don't know if they knew before or the Irish came in. I don't know the history of it totally. It's yeah. been quite a few years since I've been there, but I've been there twice. And you'll see them in the middle of all different places. And they're just lovely. Little houses and villages. And, you know, I kept on looking for the elf and the fairies. I never saw one, though. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, John, while you're still on there, one woman just wrote, fascinating to hear from both authors as well as the participant, Don Worthington. Now I want to visit Iceland. I don't know. I think I don't think Americans are allowed to go anywhere at the moment. Um, but Iceland is supposed to be a great place. I know. Well, it's only a, fo a four hour airplane ride and you can go in the morning and be in there and a quick weekend and you've got a lot to do. And I know I stopped at Reykjavik at one point um, on an airplane ride 
and there were people there who were at least a foot taller than I was, and I felt short for the first time in my life. It was wonderful. <laughs> well, I started out in short, so you can imagine how tall I felt with next to these people, <laughs> the Vikings. <laughs> yeah. It was definitely Game of Thrones. Um, it was wonderful. I thank you so much. Um, anybody else had a any visits with fairies or anything else like that before we call down? I had one other totally non-fairy thing to put on, and I don't know how many gardeners I still have on the on this list on this list, but a lot of people in the earlier programs have asked me what to do about Lily of the Valley. Um, Lily of the Valley is poisonous, goats won't eat it. The only way you can get rid of it is dig it. However, I took a walk the other day. And up on Marion Hill, there are quite a few big old houses that have made areas, you know, Lily the Valley Islands in their lawn. And they keep it that way. And it looks very nice and it works as a ground cover. So, in another, so instead of getting rid of it, maybe learning how to live with it. But tell your friend, because everybody seems to be fussing about Lily the Valley this year. Which is too bad because it does smell nicely. Um, well, I thank you all for being with us today. Um, as I said, you can go on our Facebook um, and that'll be a place to find new friends. Oh, here's the boat. Here's the boat. Yes, this is on my final. So I hope you all go out and start making a fairy home. See, look at this. See the boat, that's made out of wood. There is moss. There are little tables, and there are things, and if you knew how to sew, you could make little tiny tablecloths for that. And here are drag, these wings are made out of snakeskin, as I remember. You have an old snakeskin hiding around. And this is an interesting object. It looks like it could be an old wooden earring. I just found some snakeskin and gave it to my neighbor's kids. Very cool. Okay. So they could make a fairy house, yeah? Yep. It's something, what do you do with all those things you can find? I, when I was researching this book, it was a very hot day. It was like today. My grandkids and I were the only ones outside and I sent them out with their friends to go find things to build a fairy house. And they found all sorts of things and pots and pine cones and sticks and etc. All day they worked on their fairy house. The boys had the most fun making a mud fairy house. They had a very happy time doing that. But the girls had a very elaborate fairy house by the time they were through, complete with beds and tables and pillows, all sorts of things. There's lots of things you can do this summer with fairy homes. And you can put them with your fireflies, you can put them underneath your pine trees, you can have a wonderful time with them. Do enjoy, this is a fun fantasy program. Next, year, next week it's composting and rainwater harvesting. Very different but very useful. Okay, goodbye everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.